Thank you so much, everyone. I would request Dr. Bharat Modi to stay back. He is a panelist. Uh, the next is a symposium on uh, medial compartment osteoarthritis, HTO versus uni versus TKA. I would request the panel masters, Dr. Krishna Kiran and Dr. Sachin Tapaswi, to come up on the di to the uh, board here. And uh, among the panelists, Dr. Uh, Thomas Chandy, Dr. P. V. Kaili, Dr. Amitya Pankaj, Dr. David Fabi, and Dr. Yash Gulati, and Dr. Harvinder Chedda, <coughs> to come up among the panelists, please. So, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, with the advent of the uh, third generation uni and the microplasty, there's a lot of uh, interest on the uni compartmental knee replacement. So, we'll just go straight away. So, this is a uh, uh, this is to the panel. I'll start from the left to the right. It's a 38 year old guy with uh, 10 years of instability and one year duration of pain. Uh, so, uh, Amit, can you? Can we, can we have a scanogram? Do you have a long film? We, uh, we had a long film, but this is what we have. There is a various alignment of that knee, and it's got instability and one year duration of pain. So this, uh, if you look at the lateral film, there is uh, obviously an, a sign of ACL insufficiency. The posterior, uh, the erosion is uh, on the posterior side also. So I think it's an ACL insufficiency. What's the clinical uh, instability like? It is. ACL it is, insufficient. Yeah. So what do you want to ask now? So what would be your... Uh, in case he is a surgical candidate, meaning thereby in case he has significant pain, debilitating pain, then I think uh, after having uh, uh, radiographed him for a long film, I would offer him an HTO plus minus an ACL reconstruction. Dr. Bharat, you take on that? Yeah. I mean, given the fact that he's an ACL deficient knee, 38-year-old guy, I would reconstruct the ACL and uh, do whatever correction of pathology I can on the medial compartment as part of my arthroscopic procedure, I would not yet think of either HTO or uni or certainly not a TK. I would like to preserve this knee to the extent that I can before even sacrificing uh, the anatomy any further. But Bharat, don't you think that if you don't correct the mechanical axis, your ACL surgery is going to fail? It will. Eventually so it will become... If you want to preserve become... the joint, I think the first principle would be that you need to have good mechanical alignment, and then ligament stabilization. So you could, you could uh, uh, very well argue in favor of a mechanical realignment, either in the form of a HTO or something else that you wish. But I personally feel that at 38 years, I'm trying to see, think what would I genuinely do rather than answer a question on the uh, Are you concerned that your HTO is going to burn bridges? Is that your are you concerned by doing an HTO you're going to burn bridges? No, no. For a no. further TKA? Certainly not, not burn bridges. At the most, I'll be changing the shape of the bridge that I need to cross later. Well, so, <laughs> so it's not about burning bridges. It's about doing, doing whatever is required as and when I'm really faced with that situation. Right. The message is if you have a young patient with an ACL deficient knee with medial compartment arthritis, you get a scanogram and they get, if they don't have instability, they will get a high tibial osteotomy with a change in the slope. <coughs> but if they have instability uh, along with it, then they will get an ACL reconstruction with or without a high tibial osteotomy. So I think before we go ahead, let's get the American perspective on this problem because uh, I think the overall perception is that you tend to be a bit more aggressive on them. Is that the case? Uh, no, no. Um, are these flexion weight-bearing films? Yes. yes. Please, yeah. So he has a good joint space, and you may be able to uh, get, depending on where the projection is, you may be able to get uh, adequate uh, alignment. Uh, the best thing to do here, in uh, my view, is just do an ACL reconstruction and then remove the osteophytes both medially and laterally. And a lot of the European literature shows if you take out the osteophytes, it does help uh, restore the joint and then see which direction it takes. Uh, especially in my hands, I've seen that the HTO makes that second surgery much more difficult, especially with the uh, patellar uh, contractures, and you usually get a patella baja, and so making a second surgery, such as a partial or a total knee replacement, the HTO makes it very difficult. So I tend to avoid HTOs altogether. 
but don't you think that uh, pain is a symptom and if the patient had a bone on bone arthritis on the intermedial compartment doing an acl would be a relatively contraindicated if you yes if you have it but uh, in what we've seen clinically is that when you do the when it's unstable and bone on bone then you would the best combination for a 38 year old is an acl reconstruction with a uni arthroplasty the hto uh, the timeline for that failure is about six years, six, seven years, and uh, partial these days will outlive that. So this is a comparative evidence. There's not much difference between HTO and UK with the modern uh, HTO techniques. I think they've got a specific space. So now th this is a 50-year-old uh, guy. Uh, David, can you? 50-year-old guy with uh, pain which is disabling the activities of daily living. So I think, uh, you know, for me, my big screening test is, is the radiographs. And this guy primarily has medial compartment bone and bone arthritis. So provided that he's a candidate for surgery, you said 50 years old? Yep. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, I think if his pain, uh, I prefer the one finger sign where they're having pain, and they localize it to that medial compartment. But now that's not a deal breaker, because patients can have pain, global pain, um, uh, from synovitis and from swelling. But uh, of course, it's kind of going to engage with the patient, see where they're at. <coughs> Uh, so I would be, you know, yeah, he does have some patellofemoral arthritis, uh, but that amount doesn't really scare me. I'm willing to accept grade three uh, up to grade four chondromalacia. Now that may be in the realm of patellofemoral arthritis, but, you know, um, I think he's a great candidate for partial knee replacement. I would do it robotically uh, with uh, Blue Belt Navio. And uh, an ACL deficient knee doesn't scare me. There's literature that shows that even without an ACL, they're okay. Um, but with that, I would uh, dial in less slope into my tibial so component. So any specific uh, workup you want to do, you want to do something, uh, Bharat? You can do stress radiographs. Um, I don't think an MRI is necessary because that's not going to change my uh, So this is the three. stress radiograph. So this is one of the uh, workups. So what do you look in the stress radiograph? I want to make sure that I'm uh, able to uh, correct it to neutral, not beyond neutral. Uh, it looks like this is appropriate. The mechanical axis on the, st on the, on the stress view is, uh, looks like it's recreated grossly. Uh, 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 any role of skyline view, Dr. Thomas? So I w that's what I wanted to ask him. I mean, go back to the previous X-ray, would you please? Uh, what's your opinion on the status of his patellofemoral joint? Do yeah. you think it's uh, looking healthy or? No, it's not. It's definitely not healthy. You know, so um, I think a lot of it for me would be based on his clinical symptoms. Um, you know, this is kind of, I would call this a in-between uh, type of partial knee replacement where, you know, I would be ready to convert it to a total knee potentially at the time of the operation. The way I counsel my patients is that I have two buckets of patients, P patients that I'm 99% sure I'm going to be doing a partial knee replacement and patients where I'm 85 to 90% sure. This would probably be in that 85 to 90% sure looking at that merchant view. You know, that, that's a little, uh, little uh, kind of uh, advanced uh, disease. Uh, but I'm still not uh, excluding a partial knee replacement in this patient. Fair so, enough. Uh, Dr. Kalik, so one second. Dr. Kalik, can we get your views on the status of the patellofemoral joint and how it's going to affect your decision making? And uh, unless it's the uh, lateral facet involvement. Uh, let's so talk it's about this me patient. Medial, uh, medial uh, you know, uh, hibernation and, in fact, uh, complete loss of cartilage is very common, especially in Indian knees. So it's not a contraindication for a partial knee replacement. This case is perfect, an ideal candidate for a partial knee replacement. So now we have uh, this situation, another 50-year-old guy with a post-traumatic situation. The, they had a, he had a medial condyle fracture, and that is his uh, picture. So... Dr. Chandy? Yeah, the picture He's looks... 50 year old. Yeah, the uh, extra picture is very bad, but if you can find a functional ACL in this, you can proceed with the, with the, with the partial knee replacement. The ACL is the only thing which is going to determine the, you know, uh, the longevity and the success of the partial knee replacement. That's it. Dr. Thomas? A uh, 50 year old, uh, does he have... Uh, Patellofemoral anterior no, pain? No, he, he has no symptoms. He just has anteromedial knee pain, and he had a trauma maybe four or five years back. And uh, Do you think it is reliable to examine the ACL on, uh, uh, on an arthritic uh, knee? Yeah, I'd like to check his ACL. So can you actually reliably check the Lachman or uh, this thing in an arthritic knee, or is it... It won't be that reliable, but I would, I would examine him and do an MRI. 
if the ACL, uh, if there's no ACL, I'll do a high tibial osteotomy since the patellofemoral is, uh, because lateral joint line, joint space is reasonably okay. <coughs> As moderate degree of virus. If the ACL is torn, then I would do that simultaneously. Amit, do uh, you think that bone-on-bone -bone arthritis is a contraindication for a high tibial osteotomy? Uh, no, I don't think so. But uh, before that, I would like to make, it a po uh, make a point here. Uh, what is the range of motion in this particular case? He's got uh, nearly yes, full I range. I suspect this is a stiff knee. No, 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 good... no stiffness, yeah. Okay. So bone-on-bone -bone arthritis is not a contraindication for HTO, at least in my practice. So this was what was done, the uni was done. So uh, is age a consideration, uh, Dr. Harbinder? Do you think the age is a consideration when you look at a uni patient? Dr. Harbinder? Dr. Harbinder. Dr. Harbinder. Is age a consideration for you when you uh, look at uni as an option for a patient? Age. Age, uh, for me, age is not as, uh, as important a consideration. What I look for is the subchondral sclerosis on the tibial side. If they have good subchondral sclerosis, then I know the tibial component won't subside in a uni. And then the second most important is having an intact ACL, because without that, um, I tend to substitute for the ACL in my knees, so I think that that gives strength. And for a young patient, especially in the 50-year-old range, younger patient population, you need an ACL. So very quickly on the panel, who amongst the panel would have age as an important criteria to decide whether this patient will or will not get a partial knee replacement? Yeah, and what would be your cutoff be? See, if it's a female patient, when a patient is across 60, I would hesitate to do a, a uni and I'd rather do a, a total knee replacement because the long-term result, because I'm concerned about, about the possibility of subsidence. In a male patient, exclusively uni, active patient, possibly I would go for another five years with the uni. Female patient, I'd rather do a total, total knee replacement. Any weight-related uh, cutoff? I uh, think quickly from the panel, from left to right. Weight-related cutoff for a uni? It definitely is. Weight, weight is a major factor. I think your failure rate is very high if your patient is obese in a uni. So what is your uh, BMI cutoff for a uni? Uh, you know, I mean, if, if, a, if a patient is coming to um, uh, very, very, very uh, cautious in weight, they should not be uh, excessive weight. I would do a, pa a slim patient only. Amit, any take on that? There's no uh, magic cutoff point in my practice, but yes, an obese patient, I'm more wary of uh, giving them an option of uni. That's all. Vijay, you want to make a question? Yeah, yeah. Or a point? I want to make a point. Uh, the Oxford group have expanded the indications quite a bit, you know, as compared to the previous, the finger point. But there are two contraindications, or even the Oxford group says that, you know, unis should not be done. And one of them is post-traumatic, you know, osteoarthritis. So, and the second is post-HTO, right? So, means, you know, the previous x was a post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Maybe in an expert's hand, you can, you know, get a result. But for the general audience, for everybody, the message should go that, you know, post-traumatic osteoarthritis, uni is not a good choice. That's, that's the point I want to make. Uh, Thanks, Vijay. Yeah, another point? So it seems to me there's two problems. One's a biologic and one is a mechanical. And so each panel member has addressed those. But I wanted to get hear the panel's uh, thoughts on using mesenchymal stem cells as an addition to the treatment when you restore the mechanics and then you get ready to do something with the, the biology. So anybody on the panel having experience with using mesenchymal stem cells? for such pathology? You have experience for it? No. So I, I have started uh, using a platelet-rich plasma. Yeah. Uh, that's but it's not, still that's early not days. MSC, but. <coughs> I yeah. understand. Yeah. So it's still, a <coughs> excuse me, it's still early days. And uh, to whatever extent that I have been able to read up on the mesenchymal cells as a protagonist of repair processes, triggering of repair processes in the arthritic knee, I'm still not con completely convinced, maybe because as orthopedic surgeons, we are too much oriented towards uh, mechanics rather than yeah. just at cellular level biologics. Okay. But maybe in times to come, it could be a useful idea. Yeah, I think we'll discuss this uh, point afterwards yeah. because we have less time less and time, we want yeah. to cover more stuff on this aspect. Correct. So yeah. any deformity related uh, cutoff? Yes, I think um, that if a patient has a significant deformity, it's better not to do a uni for approximately 
15 degrees of virus of excess virus of algus and also when you when you do your stress test it should be reasonably correctable also otherwise should not prefer not to do a uni so is acl deficiency and flexion con contraction contraindication uh, david yeah, I, or, think there's, or a I think there's two thoughts. Uh, there's clear literature out there, um, I'm forgetting who was it, uh, about an ACL deficient knee that um, a partial knee replacement uh, has a role, it can work. Uh, again, uh, technically, uh, considerations, you gotta dial in less slope. And I wanna talk about uh, weight-related cutoff. Um, for me, my body mass index cutoff is probably 35, so stretching the indications, the original Scott indications. And my contention, of course, I may be biased to robotic technology. I think with the accuracy and precision of your mechanical axis, uh, I think that body mass index uh, can potentially be stress, uh, stretched because you're not, uh, your weight distribution is a lot better than it was before, so. Is there any role of a preoperative MRI, Amit? No, no role of preoperative MRI. Yeah. I, I think there's a role as far as, I think there's a role as far as the ACL is concerned. Uh, uh, Usually you'll find that these MRI scans uh, will show very ghastly appearances of ACLs and the status of the ACL intraop has not been shown to correlate very well with the MR appearance of the uh, ACL as well. We'll take one last question because we're getting pointers from here that they're already in live surgery. So let's take the one last question where yeah. we uh, finish the panel. Then. Yeah. Right. Question to the panel regarding ACL deficient knees. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Right. Now, uh, if you are using a mobile bearing uh, prosthesis like Oxford, would you still go ahead and do a uni and an ACL deficient thing? Oh, well, uh, ACL deficiency is an absolute contraindication for a mobile bearing knee. For a fixed wearing knee, you can sort of get away with an ACL deficient knee. Uh, provided you reduce the posterior slope of tibia and the patient is fairly, you know, uh, elderly uh, because it, this knee is going to wear out with this shield. It may not dislocate, but it's going, definitely going to wear out earlier. I think the answer to your question, Krishna has already put up the slide here. So that's a study again from the Oxford group and they show that uh, with or without an ACL, it doesn't make a lot of difference. But however, the fine print is that still it's not an accepted indication that you should do a Oxford or a mobile bearing knee in an ACL deficient knee. So I think that's a word of caution. Keep that as an extreme exception rather than the rule. Because if you go back with the thought process that, you know, even if it's an ACL deficient knee, you can do a uni, you're more likely to have failures. And that's not been validated completely as yet. Yeah. And so uh, uh, although there is a evidence on uh, uni in ACL deficient knee, I think you should keep it as an exception rather than the rule. That is the message. I think the panel would agree on that. So if it's an ACL deficient knee, don't do a uni. Yeah. So that I is mean, what it is. Absolutely, especially yeah. when the paper we are seeing yes. comes from the original group from where yeah. this movement and enthusiasm has started. So, so yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, there is one other question. So if you have a partial thickness cartilage loss on one of the compartments, uh, it has been shown that the unis don't do that well. So you have a bone, bone ex hibernated on the medial femoral condyle, but the tibia is reasonably okay. So that is one other uh, uh, in contraindication to do a uni probably. Uh, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, many a times, uh, you know, on the x-ray, you don't get actually bone on bone. But the patient is very painful on the medial side. And when you actually do the surgery, you find the cartilage is there on the femoral side or on tibial side, but it's, it's not really a healthy, you know, good for weight-bearing cartilage. So those patients do well with uh, uni, that's not an issue, yeah. I think uh, uh, bone on bone arthritis is a prerequisite for m me to go for a uni, but sometimes you don't get a uh, bone on bone picture on a pure AP film. So for that, you need a Rosenberg view that sometimes shows you bone on bone arthritis. I think it also depends on the patient's symptoms. If the patient doesn't have much pain with just cartilage loss, you don't need to, but the patient has severe pain disability, should consider it. So uh, I think we had a very uh, insightful uh, discussion on the indications for uni. I thank the panel for their uh, valuable inputs, and uh, uh, we are ready with the life next surgery. live surgery. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panel masters and the panelists.